All right, we are back. And I've got a new friend to talk to you today, guys. Uh, somebody that's it's fascinating because we've talked to a lot of people about scale. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a lot today, about taking a concept uh, from, from where you are right now, or even if you, you desire. You know, a lot of people that listen to our show, they want to build like a lifestyle information product business. But there are a lot of people that listen to the show that want to have or do what you've done. Um, and that being said, Rick Smith, welcome to the show, man. How are you? It's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me on. Cool, man. So you've got one of those really cool stories, right? I, I know you, you mentioned that a lot or on your website, it says a lot. You guys start with, you know, from your garage and, you know, building products and what have you. So uh, for those listening that aren't familiar with your story, obviously it's pronounced Axon, right? Correct. Okay. Name your company Axon, but it used to be Taser, formerly Taser, right? So you guys are massive, one of the biggest players in that space. So Really, really cool stuff. Start from your garage, but I'll let you tell the rest of the story if you don't mind jumping in and kind of giving people a 30,000 foot view of who you are and what you guys do. Sure, yeah. So uh, we are a tech company that likes to go after the really difficult, gnarly problems that most tech companies specifically avoid. Things like mm -hmm. gun violence, police brutality, uh, and just violence in general. Mm -hmm. uh, as we believe you know, technology is at the core of how humanity solves most of its problems. We innovate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I started this in 1993, had a couple of friends who were shot and killed mm. rather than, uh, you know, go join the typical uh, like protest approach about it. And by the way, no issue with people who share sure. political action, but that has been just particularly not effective in dealing with the gun violence problem. So yeah. the insight was if, you know, why are we still shooting bullets at people? This is a medieval technology. We should be able to invent our way out of this. Yeah. Well, so how do you know the, how, so that's a really interesting discussion point and, and one that I didn't anticipate, but nonetheless, it's great. Um, there are people that, especially with social media, that something happens and they, they run to social media to share their thoughts and opinions and feelings. And, and like you said, there's a place for that. I think it's really good. It builds awareness, right? But how and when do you know, hey, there's substance here to pursue something like you guys have done or you know what, this is, that's not me. I'm more of the, the protester type. Per like, how did you determine or what was it inside of you that knew, hey, I'm the go do find something, find a solution or develop a solution versus a protest, social media argument type person? Yeah, I, you know, I saw my dad as I was growing up was a serial entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And uh, he failed more than he succeeded, but he was always happier when he was trying to do something uh more entrepreneurial than when he would have to go get a job to pay the bills after one of them failed. Mm -hmm. So I, I had the bug from early on. And okay. if, like knowing that, look, the bar was pretty low. When you actually take a step back and you think about firearm technology, we're blowing holes in people. Like yeah. we've been doing that three, 400 years ago. I know. So this seemed like a really low technology bar to come up with another way to be able to stop people. Uh, and so just based on that sort of first principle approach, there should be some way to incapacitate a human being, whether it's with chemicals or electricity, that is going to surpass using flying shrapnel. And yeah. Now, how did you get, so at that point in time when you guys started that, were there any major players in that space or was it pretty much just use of, of fatal devices like weapons or what have you? Or is there, was there anybody using things like tasers and what have you? Or were you guys kind of the first to market? Yeah, so here's what's interesting. The name taser was already pretty well known. It had been in movies like Jean-Claude Van Damme used one in the 1980s film Time Cop. Clint Eastwood ah. used one in the 70s. The guy who invented it was a 73-year-old NASA, former NASA scientist. Okay. And I assumed that he had been very successful because Taser was so well known. I yeah. viewed him as a competitor initially until a few weeks into doing my research. I remember having dinner with my dad, you know, at the family kitchen table. And my dad says, hey, why don't you call that Taser guy? Mm. You, you have all these questions you're trying to figure out. Mm. And my initial reaction was, no, no, no. Like, he's a competitor. I can't talk to him. He'll take my ideas. At which point my dad laughed at me and he said, look, this guy's some NASA scientist who's been doing this for like 25 years. Son, he's forgotten more than you know about this space. Like you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Yeah. So this morning I dialed 411, which for some of our viewers, that's before Google, you would dial this yeah. number to get somebody's phone number. And that's how I got in touch with him. And it turned out that while he was a very successful inventor, uh -huh. the business had gone under. And actually there, it, was, it was fundamentally out of business at the time. And, and so I had to convince him to give it another shot. And we started in his garage in Tucson. Uh, and it was what would be the third 
attempt at creating a company around this taser technology. Was it bad? Was it just bad timing at that point? Or was he just kind of ill-suited being more of like a scientist type versus more of an entrepreneurial type? Or was it a combination of the two that why he hadn't really gotten it off I would the ground? Say it was, it, a lot of it was that he was more of an inventor than an entrepreneur. Uh, so sense. when he raised money, he would go invent stuff, but didn't really build out a, a team, right? You need manufacturing and sales, and you've got to figure out how to get to market, sure. of which inventing is a piece of it. So I'd yeah. say that was a big, uh, a big chunk of it. Interesting. Well, it's a very, very fascinating point because I think a lot of people have this same notion, specifically early stage entrepreneurs, right? Like they, they're in a, you know, whether it's an accelerator program, you know, I'm an EIR for entrepreneur residence for an accelerator program here in Austin. And they come in and it's like the first time they see that someone else is already doing what they've done, they're like, oh no, it's over. I can't do this anymore. But man, there's so many opportunities and you just don't know where someone's at with their business or whether there's some form of collaboration or some kind of, uh, some kind of ways to do things symbiotically that actually benefit one another, even if it's not working in direct capacity like you did. Yeah, you know, I would tell you that's number one advice I'd give to entrepreneurs is just because somebody else is already doing something similar yeah. is not, doesn't mean it's game over. And in fact, the best thing you can do is reach out to them. Yeah. Numerous times in my career, I've had that sensation like, oh, I can't talk to this guy because he'll be a competitor. Yeah. And then you finally talk to them and you realize, oh, wow, like there's some sort of collaboration. You know, with the original guy with Jack Cover, uh, reaching out to him was transformative. And then more recently, there was this Russian inventor who mm -hmm. had been basically publishing videos on YouTube for the past decade of different mm -hmm. uh, stuff he was building kind of in his garage in Russia. And I always, I always thought he was kind of a competitor. And then finally, I agreed to meet him. And next thing I know, we hit it off. I ended up hiring him. He's now one of my lead research engineers. That's uh, awesome. I have to keep reminding myself, man, like, it never hurts to talk to people. Yeah, yeah. But it's so counterintuitive compared to just who we are as people, right? We see people as like, this person's getting... The, you know, the, the, the early bird is getting the worm or I'm not, or I'm not getting it or I'm getting it or he, you know what I mean? We just view things inherently that way. But the, this is a world of abundance, man. There's so many opportunities and ways that people can collaborate with one another. So I'm yeah, glad to hear somebody like this. We, we see threats where they just don't exist. Right. It's so hard, you know, like I said, even this far into my career, I still deal with it. Yeah. I got to ask you. So I just saw for those listening audio, not when I'm watching the video here with us, um, I just saw you have two different rings on and one of them looks like an aura ring. Is that an aura ring you're wearing? <laughs> I do have an OR ring. The other I, got, I got mine on. <laughs> that's awesome. I just thought I'm like, that has to be an OR ring. That's fantastic, man. That's awesome. And we might get to that later on, but I, I, I've heard you're a big biohacker and, and that's awesome. So I'd love to talk. I'm glad. I always like when I hear uh, other people that are really involved with health and wellness and biohacking, what have you, because that's the real opportunity is increasing your human potential, increasing your level of contribution. And the only way you do, it's funny because I always say this, but in order to do more, you have to first be more, right? Like you have to level yourself up before you can level up your efforts. Yep. And in, in, my, in my situation, my audience knows, and you don't know this, but I had a major health crisis. It, it, weeks before my 30th birthday, Doc's like, look, these labs are bad, man. You're not gonna be around at 40 at this pace, like precancerous status. So for me, it was kind of out of necessity. I became a biohacker, but I was really curious. I saw, and I was like, that has to be an order. ring. So, <laughs> that's awesome, man. But what does that meant for you real quick before we move on is, is like a, a quick, you know, stop in the road or pit stop, if you will, what got you into the health and wellness biohacking type space? Was it just for that reason to level up your efforts or, or what kind of got you interested in it? Uh, for me, it's been uh, just candidly, I got into a little bit of a rhythm where every year I get older, I try to take some time in January to figure out, okay, what's latest in longevity. Mm. And we all have this disease called aging and it's going to kill us all. Yeah. Depending on who you believe, there's some folks who think we might you know, be able to extend it significantly or, or defeat it. Yeah. Uh, and I became a, a big Ray Kurzweil fan. I've put my whole uh, company through Singularity University, at least most of the yeah. leaders, uh, yeah. to sort of trigger that exponential thinking. And it's hard to be around those very creative tech types and not drink a little bit of the Kool-Aid that yeah. you know, we live in a machine. We ought to spend a little effort trying to figure out a better plan than eating the crap that tastes good uh, just... for how we're going to like extend the machine. You'd think, I mean, in the much work as we do in our businesses, you think that would make sense. You would think that'd be blatantly obvious, but to some, it is not. And, and, and I get it, right? Like you're busy working on something and, you know, it, it, that's your dream and your passion is to build this company. And so you kind of neglect, you take yourself for granted, right? You just assume that you're going to be able to just keep going, right? And doing until you hit, for, in my case, you hit a brick wall and realize, oh no, that's not realistic. That's not possible, right? 
Um, so anyway, so, so give me kind of a, a high level view. I, I obviously, you know, I know you wear the biometric devices and what have you. So is it pretty much just clean diet supplementation? What are, what are some high level things you, you do that people could- uh, diets reasonably clean? Um, okay. you know, I know I should be vegan, but I can't quite get there. Um, you know, I try to eat reasonably clean. I take probably 50 supplements a day. So I basically bought uh, Ray Kurzweil's book on aging. He wrote with uh, Dr. Terry Grossman. Yeah. And I went through and said, look, I don't have time to do a bunch of like first level research. So I find people smarter than me that have done it. Yeah. I basically went through, put all their supplements on auto order on Amazon, cost me a yeah. you know, hundred bucks a month. Yeah. And, um, and then this past year, I actually, uh, actually right before this, I was on a call with Terry Grossman, his co-author of the book. So I'm in his longevity program, which is a little more aggressive. Yeah. Uh, you know, metformin, rapamycin, injecting quercetin, uh, you know, once a week, which is a, helps clean out the senescent cells in your body. Sure. So, I, um, I, my wife and I just went to Puerto her, she's from Puerto Rico and her family still lives there. Her parents, uh, well, and some you know, outside of immediate family, right? Like uncles and aunts and cousins and stuff like that. And, but being gone a month and having to take all my supplements with me, what I do is I just, instead of take all these bottles, I just put them in Ziploc bags. Right. Well, I got stopped at the airport both ways. And I know they thought I was a drug dealer because you should have seen, I mean, it was pounds and pounds and pounds. And even coming back, you know, the interesting thing was I, a, you, you can you can weigh your bag. You know, I, I weigh my bag before I go to the airport, so it's not embarrassing. I have to get down on the floor and move stuff around. You know, because I have to. You know, it's over fifty pounds. The weight difference just in my supplements alone, from what I was taking there versus what I came back with, you could see a tangible difference. And how much, I was like, why is my bag lighter? I'm like, oh, the supplements. But it's that it's that many though. It really it's crazy. I, I swear they thought I was some kind of mule or something, just transporting drugs to and from. I've been there. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you guys are in the garage. So one of the things that I found uh, fascinating with, with how you guys got your start, and I see this, I don't want to say I see it a lot, but I, I kind of fell into that. You know, we went from doing business to then doing business with, and this is my first business, um, doing business with big players, right? Big clients. I assume you guys had government contracts because what you were selling was for that specific purpose. Is that where you guys started? And if so, how did you guys mask or provide enough value prop to be able for them to overlook the fact that you were a true startup building out of your garage? Yeah. So uh, the first seven years, we were focused on the consumer business. So okay. we were building tasers for consumers to defend themselves. And to be honest, we were failing at it. We had okay. two failed product launches. Uh, we were on the verge of death. By 99, we were out of cash. We my dad, the serial entrepreneur, had invested everything he made. He did have one successful startup in Silicon Valley that gave him the money that he ultimately ended up sinking all of it yeah. into Taser. Yeah. And there was a moment where I'm telling him not to put any more money in, but we were out of options at that point. He was already more than 100% committed because he'd guaranteed our lines of credit at the bank as well. Ouch. Uh, so, yeah, we never raised a dime of outside capital. Um, and then we pivoted and went into the police market uh, just figuring – Consumers thought this was a gimmick and we had to prove in the professional market that we had a technology that really worked. Mm. And part of that was we actually had to fix a lot of the bugs. The first generations of the technology were pretty buggy. Uh, mm. In fact, Rodney King was shot with an LAPD taser and it didn't work. And that's why they went to their batons. That was the old generation stuff. So we had to fix, uh, we had to actually go do some biohacking of our own, some anesthetized pig tests to be able to determine exactly what type of electricity it would take to reliably paralyze even the most aggressive person. And once we figured that out, and, and by the way, the testing to do that cost $2,500 and one pig and a doctor in Nebraska. So very inexpensive, just some really innovative hackery science. Like we're, we built these yeah. tests where we could vary the types of electrical energy. And very quickly we saw, oh, wow, if we do this, we can actually cause complete paralysis of the skeletal muscles and not have any impact on the heart. And so then we pivoted, went into law enforcement. And there, the good news was most police agencies in the US are small 10, 20 person departments, and they can make pretty fast decisions because we didn't have to go through the DOD or the Department of uh, Justice, you know, small agencies. So we literally launched with a Winnebago campaign going around the country, just doing demos, uh, hitting cops with a taser. And the great thing was the weapon worked so well it was so transformatively better than anything they'd seen. We didn't need a big fancy marketing campaign. Uh, me and a former Marine in a Winnebago going cross country was enough to, to, to launch the product. And that got us to, to starting to scale where we got cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. And then our next stop was an IPO, which is crazy. Okay. Nobody would talk to us to a public offering. That is wild. Okay. So two questions on that then. So when you guys were going B2C, right? When this is a consumerized product, 
was it viewed as like a, you know, as seen on TV kind of thing where it's like, come on, that doesn't work. Was it a marketing thing or was it purely that people just didn't buy in? It was an adoptability issue or was it a combination of the two? It was both. Uh, So we launched with the sharper image. Remember the the sharper image catalog in the nineties. That was like the consumer. We should legitimize you because that was viewed as something very credible. Well, to a degree, but you know, we're in a store with the tie racks, you know, the automated tie racks and they have a lot of gimmicky stuff too. That's true. That's true. Uh, uh, That, so I think there's a little bit of that patina of, all right, this is a little gimmicky. But then the other thing is, yeah, the product actually did that well. I mentioned Rodney King was shot with an old case or the early generation yeah. systems, which we copied in our first. Actually, it would work on a, on a random Joe. But if you had somebody who was pumped up on PCP or Wouldn't who matter. was afraid for their life, would go to jail. Like human beings can fight through a lot of pain. Yeah. So it turned out those skeptical consumers were right. Mm. And we had to actually re-engineer the product. And then once we did, then we had no problem selling it to cops because literally we'd go to a police department and say, okay, bring us your biggest, toughest guy and he can make a hundred bucks. It's right here. All he's got to do is come take it out of my hand and we'd shoot him with a taser and nobody ever got the hundred bucks. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I would think now was, I assume pepper spray was around back then. It was. Right? So, okay. Cause that seems like a more, if I'm a consumer or, you know, I'm equipping my wife or whatever with something, I would think pepper spray first versus taser would be like, that seems a bit I don't want to say unnecessary, but maybe a little bit too. It'd be like giving somebody a grenade launcher instead of just a pistol, right? It can <laughs> kind of do the same thing. It's just a little bit overkill maybe, especially if there's a major price difference there between the two. But Yes. So pepper spray, yeah, it's a great, very convenient tool. It's, you know, 10 bucks. You know, we're up in the four or $500 price point to start. Yeah. Uh, there is a big difference in that pepper spray is great as a deterrent. It, it like creates a burning sensation and all sure. that. Uh, it doesn't incapacitate though. So if you have somebody who's coming after you and they want to hurt you, uh, in some cases, pepper spray, it's a chemical irritant, right? It can actually make them a bit more irritated where uh, it does is actual incapacitation where they're going down regardless of whether they feel pain. But see, without the internet and being able to educate people on like a webinar or something like that to sell that, because if you were selling just on like a catalog or a storefront, you don't have the ability to counter that objection, right? Yeah. So I could see how people wouldn't have got or arrived at that conclusion that you just explained. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm thinking like being an uneducated potential consumer myself back in the mid nineties, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to know what you just said. So I can yeah. see why that didn't work out in that sense. Now talking about uh, approaching. So you, you spent several years, I think you said what, nine years trying to, trying to build on the consumer side. Is that what you about said? Seven years. For seven. seven years. All right. So shifting, shifting over, if you had sold millions of these things and then took that success over to police, I would see that'd be an easier conversation to have. How did you get it's all about getting a foot in the door, right? How did you get your first foot in the door? Was it because they were smaller municipalities and that's what you focused on to get a foot because they would listen versus a large, you know, city of like Washington, DC, right? Like there's just so much going on. You're probably not even going to see your, your inquiry. How did you get an initial chance at, at presenting your product to them as a true startup that hadn't had much success in those previous seven years? Yeah. So the couple things, number one, we identified fairly early on that, Law enforcement is used to paying for training. And if we gave a free training certification, Very smart. A, lot of, like, a lot of training officers would say, hey, I'll go. It's one more certification on my, you know, there was value to what we, we, we would give it away. Uh, and so they'd come, they'd do the eight hour class. And most of the time they actually didn't, they weren't that interested in what we were doing. It's like, hey, I'm going to rack up another certification. I'm kind of curious what you guys are doing. But then after the first few of them, we mm-hmm. would allow volunteers to take a hit. And then it spread like wildfire because now this is in the early days of the internet. You didn't have social media yet, but police agencies are all pretty well connected because they have this ability to share, to share information like, you know, most wanted lists, et cetera. And so words just started to spread word of mouth among our user community. Uh, And then once they did, you know, then we'd get inbound calls saying, Hey, we'd like to host a training class here and we'd go do a course do demos. And then next thing you know, that age by and it would spread from there. Basically you're doing webinars before webinars exist in yeah, right? webinars it's like trade stuff. show. It's like trade show. It's the same model. It's just different modalities now. Right. It's the exact, it's basically, the, that's interesting. So what were their major, I mean, obviously they saw the product and it worked, right. It just immediately just would incapacitate somebody that was, was trying to do that. I guess the thing is for me, kind of trying to think back in that point in time of like, did they rampantly know, that it was an issue, right? Like I'm trying to determine if I'm a police officer, how do I know when it's appropriate to, to reach for my taser versus when it's appropriate to reach for my gun? Is that 
Is that something that you don't worry yourself with to think about and as far as the training, because that's part of what they do to, to train their officers? Or how did you guys position yourselves to be able to educate them on the product itself? Yeah, training is a big element. So we, we had to get deep in the training right from day one. Yeah. I'm going to help them understand the product. So there's sort of two elements there. One is getting them to see the need for the product. And that was pretty easy. So up until that point in time, non-lethal weapons were seen as like the politically correct thing that the mayor or the suits at town hall wanted to make me carry if I'm a cop. But yeah. most of the stuff had a terrible reputation. If you ever use pepper spray on a guy on PCP, he just smiles at you. He's like, huh, what are you doing? Um, so, uh, or even bean bags, all the non-lethal stuff relied on pain. Yeah. And so it worked great on, you know, some unaggressive individual who you probably shouldn't be using force on anyway, but you get somebody who's pumped up, who's jacked, who wants to fight, all yeah. the other stuff would just irritate them. So number one is just getting the product dialed in with good demos. We could show that it would work on aggressive people. That was part number one. Now the second stage, early on, we did face a fair number. I remember there was a cop out of Spokane, Washington who told me, look, man, like I've got a gun, I got my fist. Why do I need this taser weapon? And then he went through our training class and then his, his, his agency trialed it. And he got into a situation where he had some young girl that was suicidal with a knife and he was able to disarm her with the taser. Oh, wow. And then he wrote me back and he said, they will pry my taser from my cold dead fingers. Wow. So, you know, we did have to get them past that mental block. And, and actually this is pretty interesting where historically we've had to be very careful to say, look, the taser is not a replacement for a firearm. You, mm -hmm. you don't take a taser to a gunfight, but you use it while the situation is escalating, when you're not yet justified to use your gun, you can intervene with a taser and try to end it early while yeah. everybody's still alive. Yeah. This is something that we just shifted. So I just wrote this book, The End of Killing, mm -hmm. where for the first time we've come out and we've said, guess what, folks? We believe non-lethals will actually replace the gun in the next decade, where actually you'll have non-lethals that outperform your pistol, in which case, yeah, you would take a taser to a gunfight, not because you want to be nice to the guy on the other end, but because the non-lethal is actually going to be faster more. and more reliable. And that's, that's a pretty interesting conversation that's happening right now because it's it's a big mind shift. And not yeah. everything's caught on, right? That's why I wanted to start having the conversation now. Like, hey, if you had Captain Kirk's Star Trek phaser, you know, why would you blow holes in people anymore? Because right, it's right. faster and more reliable. Right. And people are having a lot of uh, interesting deep conversations about that. I'm sure they are. So I imagine one of the things that was difficult and, and I feel like it's died down a little bit. Maybe I'm just not paying attention as much as I was, but there a few years ago, we were seeing a lot of incidents, you know, a lot of really notable incidents of people that, and, and, I, and I think, so there's, there's kind of two sides of that story potentially. One is that we didn't have the ability to live stream or, or pull out our devices to record these incidents actually happening. So some argue that this has always been going on. We just didn't have the ability for people to see it wide, you know, mainstream and widespread. The other argument is that it's just happening more frequently. So I don't know whichever side you stand on. It doesn't matter, but what well, maybe it does. But anyways, how did you guys go about, I don't want to say protecting your reputation, right? But if you're the taser company and yep. people aren't using tasers, even though they're not doing it, could be a reflection on your company or your brand and that why are they not opting to use? So how did you guys navigate that to protect your reputation or to maybe take more of a, of a demonstrative step and being forceful and, hey, guys, this is a problem and we're here to help you fix that problem? Yeah. So a um, couple of things wound up in there. So when we first launched Tasers in the early days, there was very positive public reaction. Oh, hey, look, here's I'm this sure. thing. Cops are going to try to not shoot people. Then once it explodes and every cop in America is carrying one, you're going to have some bad outcomes where people get hurt or you even have some people who've died after being hit with a taser weapon. And, yeah. and that explodes. Uh, we, in 2004 and five, we had just a huge media storm of negative controversy. Yeah. Uh, and much of it was also allegations that police were abusing people with the taser mm -hmm. weapon. And that's when we actually got got into the body camera space where we said, look, ah. we have to number one, do our part. How do we, how do we deter bad officers from being abusive? And number two, how do we protect officers who've used it legitimately to be able to defend why they did it? Well, if we have a body camera recording, if the cop's abusive, we'll see it. If he's justified, we'll see that too. Uh, and that actually turned out to be one of these great examples where if you dig deep and understand your customer's problems, you can, create much more value for them. So today mm -hmm. our body camera 
and the software associated with it is bigger than the taser business. And it started as a defensive <laughs> measure to protect the taser business. And now it's growing. It's, it's bigger. That such a valuable teaching lesson there, because I think a lot of people don't realize that all problems are, have, they bring about potential opportunities. Period. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. There was a moment in time where we shifted from, we were very technology driven, like, wow. okay, we're the taser company. How do we make tasers and sell them to more people? And we had a couple of products that kind of failed there. But then we had this insight that, wait a minute, we have this great relationship with all these police agencies and they are suffering with all of these litigations and all the negative press about how they're using tasers or when they shoot somebody, just police brutality in general. Yeah. And we realized, well, we could go solve that problem. We'd have to learn some new skills ourselves, but we then repositioned ourselves as very customer centric, right? We're the technology partner to police. And if they need cameras, we'll go figure out cameras. And if those cameras generate a lot of data, okay, we'll go figure out software. And now we're running the largest cloud software business anywhere in local government. We have 60 petabytes of police video at 60 million gigabytes and growing at about four petabytes a month because we host all the video for them. Uh, we're sort of the iTunes of policing. That is pretty amazing. That's pretty cool. So to get to that point, because we, now we're talking about a lot of scale, right? Like what, what would you say in terms of if I, grow, if I drove down the streets of Austin, Texas right now, if, and I drove past 10, you know, cop cars, right? How many of those 10 would you say are carrying your equipment? In Austin, it should be nine out of 10. That or is wild. But across the country, would you say probably a fair amount are utilizing your equipment? Oh, yeah. So the taser weapons are in 95% of the agencies, almost That's every crazy. agency has tasers. The question now is, do they share them like New York PD or do they issue them to every officer? And I believe Austin issues to every officer. Just like, you know, it makes sense. You give them a gun, you should give them every opportunity to avoid getting to the point where they gun. So, so I guess what I'm, what I'm leaning at then is you guys are the industry leader is what I'm, is what I'm kind of getting at here. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. So that all said, uh, you know, I talked about it earlier when we've kind of started our discussion here, there's a lot of people that come in and they have lofty, ambit. like they want to solve a big problem, right? You solved a big problem and you're continuing to work on solving that big problem. They don't want to just get online and do, you know, what I do with this particular, you know, one of the things that I do, which is this platform, which is to just, you know, build a nice little information product business, not diminishing what I do, but it's not, you know, I'm not going to go IPO with a content platform. It's just, that's just not going to happen. It's a great revenue stream and I love doing it. It's a passion project and I can really reach thousands, if not millions of people and, and help inspire them and give them the advice and the stuff that they need to go do stuff like what you're doing. Right. So, so it's very much a passion project for me in that regard. But there are other people that are like, you know what, I want to build something that has social impact, right, that can fix a big problem that we have. And I want to do that with technology. And I'm starting in my garage and I have zero resources or no funding and I'm bootstrapped and I'm kind of making ends meet and so on and so forth. And then looking now at where you've gone throughout that entire trajectory, what would you say have been the biggest things about you that you've had to change from back in garage days to now? And what things have remained the same in terms of the core essence? And how have you kept that as the core guiding values of your organization from where you were then to where you are now? It's a so, really loaded question. Yeah. So uh, early on, it's biased to action. Like you cannot have analysis paralysis in the early days of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most people, the big challenge is they, they just, they have the idea, they're passionate about something, but they never take the leap and just start doing it. Yeah. So it's that first step where you throw yourself into the abyss and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. For me, it was deciding I am not going to interview for a job at the end of grad school. Mm -hmm. I Because then I figured, well, once I interview, then I might get an offer. And then if I get an offer, I've got to choose between a concrete offer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Crazy idea. So I'm just going to like not go get any offers. I'm going to go chase this for a while. And I'm going to yeah. see what happens. And then every morning you get out of bed and you're like, okay. What's the thing I can do today? For the first couple of weeks, it was going to the ASU Law Library, researching patents, researching the industry. Yeah. Then there was that conversation with my dad where it was, hey, you should call this Jack Cover guy, this NASA guy who invented the taser. And then bang, that's when it lit off and I convinced him to start in his garage and away we go. Yeah. Then in the early days, you, you as an entrepreneur, you have to be kind of a micromanager. You've got to make fast decisions. Mm. You know, um, I think there's a lot of talk today about having data-driven decisions and that's yeah. a good thing, but it can be a bit of a luxury when you're, when you're scrapping, you know, you've got to get as much data as you can and decide and go. Yeah. Then as you get bigger, um, it was a very difficult transition for me to go from being the 
entrepreneur founder to CEO of a larger company. That's what I was getting at. And, and, and I was, I, I, about 2014 was the low point where I'd say I was at the middle, all roads led through Rick. I thought my job was to, you know, solve all the interesting problems in the company. And I just realized I was on the critical path of everything. You know, I'd be up writing web pages at 11 o'clock at night. And mm. I remember having one of those moments where it's like, wait a minute, why am I the guy doing this? Um, and I realized the problem wasn't the company. The problem was me. Yeah. I had to start figuring out how to really let go and just religiously look at how I would assign things to people where you could give them a nebulous goal, like make our marketing great and not have to get in and, and micromanage it from there. And if you didn't have the right person, then you had to replace them and, and get somebody else and give it a try and getting the right butts and seats uh, is, is the number one thing you have to do once you're starting to hit certain scale. And then at the scale we're getting at now, now we're getting big enough. My, my fear is that we become too much of a big company and decision cycles are too slow. You know, you become too bureaucratic. So now I'm really looking at how do we force, force decisions down to leaders of small teams. My goal is to, to keep Axon a, like a constellation of startups flying in formation rather than one big bureaucracy. So more like subsidiaries within like the parent company that is Axon then at that point. Yeah, not, not from a legal- Not from a legal standpoint, standpoint, I know, but in terms of the way you're viewing it though. Yep, so the, the, the basically, how can we empower decision makers that are leading relatively small teams that can move fast? Because once you get above a certain team size, things just slow down. You know, like in a meeting, if you're in a meeting with six to eight people, you can get stuff done. Have that same meeting with 20 people and now the group dynamic changes. It's like Congress as opposed to a small team. Yeah. And, and I think we see that in general, the more we can, we can empower small teams, either within larger projects or when we're doing new things, we have a concept of what we call Delta teams, which is, all right, you know, it's like Jeff Bezos, two pizza team, small yeah. team, go figure it out. Here's some money, ask for permission, not forgiveness, go figure it out and, and bring us back some solutions. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think there's, there's a lot of people that think that once they hit, once they're bringing in the revenue that the challenge, they, the, the goal has been complete, right? They're not, all their problems are going to go away, right? And this was the big mistake that I made is we're generating enough revenue. I'll have enough money to pay for those problems to be fixed, right? Right now, the problem is I don't have enough money to fund what it is that I'm doing. So the, yeah. the goal, the goal is to raise money and get to a certain revenue milestone and everything's going to be peaches and cream. And the opposite is true because that's when the real challenges begin. Yeah. Never throw money at problems. Yeah. Every time I've tried to solve a problem with money, it gets Never. worse. There's yeah. no, there's just no substitute for rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work and getting the job done. If it's not you, finding somebody else who's going to do that. But like this idea of, oh, we're going to hire some really smart consultants. Yeah. You can't outsource the problem solving ever, in my opinion. No, I told 100%, 100,000 percent. I have many stories that just come to mind of times when I just got hosed with, with thinking that I could just do that. So how have you protected yourself? Because you're, you're like me in a sense of burn the ships, and just jump in, right? So, how? Well, for one, this. Do you think that's the only way to do it? Because some people like the transition, or is it just our archetype, right? The type that likes that needs that, like, hey, I'm in it right now, and and I got to make this work or else, kind of thing. So that's the the first question I had for you. Do you think that that's wholly true for every entrepreneur, or do you think that's just for archetypes like you and I? I think there's different entrepreneurial types. Like, I, I wouldn't say that it's the the only approach I tend to, like the nature of our business, we tend to like to run after problems that most sane businesses wouldn't touch. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the taser weapon business. That's <laughs> litigation. Very PR, politically charged. Yeah. Um, body cameras. And we started first putting cameras on cops, super controversial. Cops didn't want to carry them or didn't want to wear them. They didn't want to be recorded. Citizens were worried about surveillance. So in that respect, I think our business is a bit unique in that we look for things that where the perceived risk is higher than the real risk. And there's yeah. opportunity there that most people aren't going to lift up the rock and find. So I think that's typically worked pretty well for us. Although, you know, we've had some spectacular failures too. There's a time, you know, when you, when you do take a burn the ships approach, sometimes you got to put a bullet in it. Yeah. Say, okay, yeah. this one's going to work. Uh, they're yeah. going back. So it's dead. Redeploy the team on something else. Yeah. Well, I see it. I think it depends on also, maybe you would agree with this. It depends on the business model, right? Like, so for, for lifestyle online business selling information products, it, you can, you can do both. You can still have your, your business, your job, right? You keep your nine to five and you can do content creation, blogging, stuff like that. 
in your spare time and make the transition and not put so much pressure on yourself, right? Because I see some people have expectations that this is just going to happen overnight, right? There's the one funnel is going to work and they're going to be making money and supplement their, or, you know, subsidize their income. And that doesn't happen. They end up going back to the workforce. So it's, I see it a lot. And it's, it's honestly, it's, it's, it's a, it's a debate that I don't know that I have a solution for. I, like I said, I'm like you in that just jump in and figure it out. But that was a very stressful process as it was. It sounds like for you as well. It is. Yeah. Although I would say if, if you really want to do something transformative, if you've got a business yeah. that, is not going to be a lifestyle business. Like you want to go solve some problem that nobody has solved yet. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the bar that I, I generally propose to people is you need to feel so passionate about this that you're ready to fail at it for the next seven to 10 years. Yeah. Where you, you're going to be making less money and, and there may be days when it, it's so dark, you don't think you're ever going to make it out, but you're yeah. so passionate about the problem that you'll stick it through. If it meets that bar, then you should probably go do it. But if you know, I, I remember the early in the first round of the internet gold rush. I had friends who made a bunch of money when they moved out to San Francisco in the early 90s because they love computers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, boom, the internet bubble's happening. And then everybody else rushes out to make a quick buck and they all got slaughtered. Uh, so, my general rule of thumb is don't try to make money. Find a problem you're passionate about solving and then build a business model around that yeah. problem. But well, your passion will carry you through the dark days because it's rare that people hit it out of the park on the first shot. Totally. Well, and I think today too, and you didn't have the luxury of this. I actually, nor did I when my first, when my first business, but the gig shared economy, right? Like you can, you can go out and drive for Uber. You could, if you have an extra, even a, a futon, put it on Airbnb, you could do Uber eats. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can make money while you're building your business. If you haven't received funding yet. Cause I know a lot of people, they're kind of scratching and clawing to get funding or, or to close funding. And the problem with that is, is if you aren't putting food on your table, you're not putting your best foot forward in those negotiations for your funding, right? Like you're, cause you need, you're going to die without the money. And they, they can sense that they know that investors know that. And you yeah. can end up, you can end up getting in bed with the wrong investor. If you get desperate, I always say urgency, not desperation. Right. And that's really important. Yeah, I agree hundred uh, percent. Though I do think that urgency, that's when you do your best work, right? Totally. We finally solved the taser effectiveness problem when we were out of cash and there was no silver bullet in sight. It was like, oh shit, we're gonna have to do the hard work of actually solving yeah. the, the gnarly problems about making this thing work. And we've got yeah. limited money and we got to get it to market. You got to do it. Here. Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, all right. So how did you, because you mentioned this, and I think it's a really interesting topic and one that we've talked about before, but not at length. You've grown to a point where, like you said, you were doing like web pages and stuff in 2014. It's like, why am I still doing this? When did or how do you prevent yourself? Because it sometimes you said like you've got to you got to put a bullet in it and you've got to just move on from that initiative and you got to roll up your sleeves and do the hard work. When do you know it's something that you should roll up your sleeves and it's uniquely you should be doing versus this is a problem that I need to put somebody else and assign them to? How do you hold yourself back? It sounds like you're more of the type A hands on type guy. When do you know it's something that you need to work on versus something somebody else needs to work on? And when do you know it's time to make that transition? Because that's a really tough time to know. Like, it's not like you, slip a, you flip a light switch and it's like, okay, today I'm CEO, but before I, yesterday I was founder, right? How did yeah. you navigate that transition? And when, how do you protect yourself from being the web page guy again at two, in, like you were in 2014? Yeah, it, it's, I definitely say it's more of an art than a science. I don't know that I've got <laughs> yeah. like some really clean playbook. I don't know, right. Uh, I, you know, now I'd say is we're at the scale we're at now, I tend to focus more on, okay, what could be falling between the cracks that is you get to be a large, we're 1300 people now. And the people working on this software product over here may not be talking to people working on this hardware product over here. And they may not be talking to the sales guy who's interacting with, you know, a customer who's having some specific problem over here. So I, the way I think of myself now is, my job is the storyteller of the business. And mm -hmm. I don't mean that like making shit up storyteller. I mean, no, no, no. what is the story, the reason for our existence? Yeah. And what is the story of how all these things are going to fit together five years from now? Um, and so my job is to sort of talk to all the people that are creating uh, at the various edges of the company, particularly the ones on the customer edge and on the product development edge, and making sure that I'm, I'm I'm helping tie that together cohesively, yeah. Because uh, that's the one thing that doesn't happen organically. And as you get bigger, I've seen a lot of times you get these disconnected, like the right hand isn't talking to the left hand. Yeah. So I try to get out of things where they're doing formative, uh, like owning a specific project. Um, I own, my job now is to 
own the collection of how all those projects come together. Interesting. And then the other thing I've done is I, I've basically engineered myself out of day-to-day management. Because mm. uh, if you think about like, it's so easy for your to-do list to just own you. And yeah. you could, you could, you could stay busy 20 hours a day working on stuff and never get to the strategically important long range stuff. Cause there's nobody knocking on your door on the strategic stuff. There's no advocate for it. We're all the little stuff. Yeah. There's tons of advocates. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I think I've come to realize is, uh, you know, each of our brains, we only have so many synaptic cycles per day. We have so much we can process. Yeah. And the stuff that really stresses you out are all the people issues, like managing just people in general. And I love people, but like if, if somebody comes to me now with a people issue and they come like, hey, so and so and so and so are having this issue and they're not getting along, I refer that to one of my operational leads. Yeah. Uh, I found that just that's the stuff that eats you alive where you're up at three in the morning. Oh, I've got to go deal with this people issue tomorrow. And those are endless. And yeah. so I found finding people that are really good at that, and that's not my forte, has allowed me to take a step back now where. I spend a lot more time looking across the across the ecosystem. At, okay, where are we going? What's the next problem we need to solve? You know, which of my teams might be solving a problem in a suboptimal way because they're not connected to the big picture. Yeah, well, I know for me, I don't know if this is the way you felt, but removing myself from that that day to day type stuff, um, there was definitely a, not. I wouldn't call it an identity crisis, but it was definitely like um, how do I is what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to do now valuable, right? Because you see the value associated with doing some of the to do stuff. And then after that, you're like, wait, so my job now is to like build culture. Like that seems so vague and abstract. Like that's not really valuable. So it's like, is what I'm doing really worth the time that I should or the money that I'm doing it? Like, is it, you see, you know what I'm saying? Like it just, you don't see that immediate sense of reward that you got from the to do work that you were doing before. So it's, it's like, it's hard to have value association with it. When you're digging ditches or mowing the grass, you know where you've been, right? You right. see it very tangible. That's uh, yeah. I did. I definitely went through a, a big identity crisis during the transition, where you'd go home and you'd think, "Geez, what did I really do?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. Although I, I, I now try to think in terms of, okay, what have I done in the past six months? If you do it on a daily basis, mm. then. Uh, you tend, you're going to be focused on very tactical things. Yeah. If I try and pull out and be like, okay, what have I done that's meaningful in the last three to six months? Yeah. And what am I going to do that's meaningful in the next three to six months? That time horizon is really helpful for me at focusing on, okay, what are the big problems we've got to focus on? Right. And, and, and frankly, I've gotten pretty good. Uh, it's going to sound terrible, but I, I just let things slide off my plate. I'm, I'm not the most reliable guy to get small things done. Mm. I, because ultimately, if you spend your, your whole day just hitting stuff, you know, back over the fence, then you're never going to, you know, you're going to be just reacting all the time. Yeah. And you got to get comfortable that, you know, and having people around you, they're like, okay, I need to rely on you guys to pick up all that stuff so I don't drop any big balls. But I want to focus on, you know, what are the initiatives where we're going to be focused over the next year, not tomorrow. Right. Like you said, it is an art, not a science. I appreciate you trying to, uh, to explain the art of it. It's definitely, it definitely takes some, some experience and some navigating of your own, but I appreciate you trying to explain your own methodology there. I think it's really valuable. Um, let's talk about the book. So the end of killing, right? So is it out? When does it come out? What's it about? What can, can readers hope to, to glean from this read? Why did you write it? Why was now the time to write it? Yeah. So the end of killing, the thesis is, I think we can get to a point where we don't kill each other anymore. And we're not going to get there by sort of dividing into camps and throwing rocks at each other and, and sort of the divisiveness that you, you can feel happening sort of in the world today. Um, I, and in particular, when you think about things like gun violence, police brutality, uh, it's, police brutality is not gonna go away because we all go out and we protest and we tell police that they're racist thugs, right? That's, that's gonna make the problem worse, not better. Those right. are people too, right? And we need to understand like there's, there's nuance to how you approach these things. And ultimately, I think technology has a huge role to play. Now, mm. technology alone is not a panacea. Yes. Some of it can be abused and misused. I'm glad you say that. But the, um, similarly, we can't be afraid of it. So like artificial intelligence, you talk about AI and policing, and immediately you're talking about Minority Report, The Terminator, and George Orwell. <laughs> the most extreme example. <laughs> yes. Okay, yes, those are the things that could go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> You know, 
we can't expect police to operate out of the 1970s with typewriters and post-it notes. Totally. Like, similarly, data-driven policing, artificial intelligence could actually be built responsibly to squeeze bias out of the system. And actually, once you start to systematize things in algorithms, they become much more open to analysis than things that happen inside a human brain, which is yeah. the most biased data system we have today. And so the point of the book was, I wanted to run at some of the most controversial challenges in the world today, police brutality, gun violence, school safety, uh, or school shootings, and get past sort of the simplistic, hey, every teacher should carry a gun, or no, we should take away everybody's guns. Well, we've had this debate. We're probably not going to change each other's minds. And I just try to stay out of those debates where I'm looking to saying, well, wait a minute, we should be thinking about different ways to protect our schools or for police to do their job. Yeah. Where, like, one of the crazier ideas I put forth in the book is what if we had police operated drones with non lethal weapon cap capability pre installed around schools? So, next time there's a shooter, you're not relying on the school safety officer, which I'm not saying that we still need people sure. like that, but augment them. Yes. If we had a fleet of drones that the police dispatch could control, now we don't want them probably armed with fully automatic weapons that can kill people, but with either pepper spray or taser type weapons where you could take down a shooter without killing them. Actually, there this could be a whole new way we think about the problem that doesn't require sort of running to these polarized, like more guns, less guns. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, my, my father-in-law, we're, we're, we're joking, it's not really a funny joke, but it, it's kind of, it shows you the, the, the polarity that we see a lot of now with the, that divisiveness. But it was like giving guns to teachers, um, what happens when the teacher is somebody that is mentally ill and uses the weapon against students? Then what do you do? Give the students guns too? You're going to save little kids sitting in the classroom with guns? I mean, so, but I get like a lot of it is not necessarily just the weaponry, but also a part of the human condition, right? So yep. how do you navigate that? As well, that you that's, where, that's where things like <laughs> when you use automated systems, like let's say you had small robots at school that were, or, or drones. And you could use it anytime you've got a, a well-designed technology system, you can do two key types of systems, right? Where there has to be an event like a gunshot detected or a camera that's triggering something and a human yeah. operator that approves it, right? You can start to build controls into the system that you can't when you just hand a gun to a teacher and say, good luck, because yeah. they're going to do things. Like, they're going to leave it somewhere unintentionally. They're going to leave it out on their desk. They're going to drop it occasionally. You know, mm -hmm. NYPD officers, some of the best trained in the world have accidental discharges. Teachers yeah. will too. So anyway, so in the book, I, I go into you know, AI, face recognition, uh, a lot of these technologies where I think the solution doesn't fit on a bumper sticker. We can't yes. say yes or no. It's going to be, all right, this gonna, we're going to have to dig in and do the hard work. Yes. When should police use AI? Yes. When should they use face recognition? Um, yes. And the answer is, again, it, they're going to be nuanced and they're going to evolve over time, but somebody's got to start doing the work uh, and... and, and we're not going to solve it in the midst of a vociferous protest. It's going to be in a collaborative setting with civil yes. rights advocates and police leaders and technologists sitting down together with a solutions mindset of, okay, how do we design this stuff the way, so it creates the world of Gene Roddenberry, mm. Star Trek, not George Orwell. I think this could turn into a rabbit hole quickly with this, but I, I totally agree. So I'm glad you wrote the book on it because that's very, very fascinating. And I totally agree. And I think that's part of the problem with our society today is that they're looking for the bumper sticker solution, right? It's, more guns or no guns. And it's just like, there's got to be something in between as far as how we navigate and manage this because it's more than just a bumper sticker solution that we're looking for. This is a multifaceted, very complex issue. So yeah, it sounds sure. like that's a lot of what you address in the book. Yeah, for sure. That, you know, it's, it's tempting to, to balkanize and to join our intellectual tribes and, mm -hmm. and to sort of view the other ideas with hostility. And I think yeah, I think we're hitting a low point. You know, things go in cycles. I think people yeah. see it happening. You know, I think, um, you know, we will find our way out of sort of this overly uh, divisive time that we're in. Yeah. But I think part of it uh, is just, uh, frankly, getting more people to take solutions mindset. So we recently created this AI ethics board where we brought in civil liberty experts, community experts, and police and we actually got in a room, about a dozen people. And it's interesting, we got past all the, you know, sort of all the name calling you see out in the public media, and we got down to actually working on some of the problems. Now, one of the early recognitions was, it's too early to do face recognition. It's too biased, it's not 
reliable enough yet. And we basically said, okay, we as a tech company are going to abide by that recommendation and we're not going to deploy it, but we're going to continue to do research because there will come a day when face recognition is superhuman. It's going to be better and less biased than people. Then the question is, all right, well, now when do we use it? Because we still probably don't want every officer logging every human being's, you know, location, identity, and whereabouts. That's kind of creepy. But the, certainly we probably want it when you're looking for guys on the FBI wanted list, you know, terrorists, child abductors, et cetera. So how do we design it so it protects us from the really dangerous people and it doesn't infringe the civil liberties of everybody else? And I don't have a great answer to that yet, right. but it's solvable. Well, and when does it become presumptuous too? Because just because there's facial recognition and it sees somebody that maybe has the propensity or the background of doing something that they're not supposed to be, you know, illegally, doesn't mean that they in that specific moment are going to be in the act or predetermine the act thereof of what their intention is or what they're doing at that moment. You know what I mean? Now, seeing somebody walk in and to a school, for example, that is a, a, a sex offender, that's a, that's, a, that's a no-brainer, right? That's a red flag. It's like, he's not supposed to be here. But in, in normal circumstances, I can see where people would arrive at the minority port conclusion of facial recognition sees this person. He has a historical background of doing X, Y, or Z, must be up to something that he shouldn't be doing, right? That's actually where I, I dedicated a whole chapter in the book to rethinking our laws, uh, starting with the war on drugs. Yeah. Uh, because I think when you think about over-policing, uh, the war on drugs has just created an environment where there's an incentive for police officers. We're actually asking them to enforce these laws that I think are now just out of step with American I society. To totally agree. And as a result, they end up infringing a lot of people's civil liberties. We've imprisoned a large portion of the population. And yet, if you so we declared the war on drugs in 1971. If you plot tobacco use, the war on tobacco has been far more effective. And we yeah. haven't thrown people in jail. We yeah. aren't fueling black markets and you know drug, drug lords and tons of inner city violence. So I think part of this is we need to presume the government's gonna have a lot more data on all yeah. of us. We can't yeah. make the censors go away. We should actually go back and take a rethink of what laws do we really want the government enforcing? And I think it's, they should protect our safety. They should protect our privacy. And we ought to get the government kind of out of trying to enforce morality or moral choices. Yeah. And well, you talk about you talk about antiquated means. That's the most antiquated means of, of, of jurisdiction and regulation that we have is still relying on humans to do a lot of what the government does. Right. A lot of that could be automated or, or augmented via technology, which is exactly what you're talking about fundamentally. Yeah. One, I haven't gotten to this yet, but one of the mental, ex one of the thought exercises that I look forward to doing in the next couple of years is also the whole model of incarceration. Yeah. That's another medieval technology, throwing people in jail. Totally. Now, there's sometimes you got to do it if you have, you know, if you have Hannibal Lecter, the serial killer. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. But you think about all these low level offenders, we throw them into jail and we basically put them into criminal school yeah. where we basically put their life on a downward trajectory from which they will likely never recover. Yep. And I don't know what the answer is, but much like, you know, a bullet is medieval, so is mass incarceration. And I think uh, we have, I, I'm looking forward to taking a step back, meeting with some experts in that space to see, huh, there's, there's got to be another way to think about corrections. You've seen this stuff. They've done social experiments where they've tested the psychology of both, not just the criminals, but also, I think it was like a... Um, I don't want to say Harvard. I don't want to misspeak or, or mis, you know, misrepresent this, but it was either Harvard. It was like an Ivy League, high, like MIT or, Stanford, or Harvard, I think. Stanford maybe, where the, where this they had like some students pretended they like had this like a, a a makeshift prison, right? And some were prisoners and some were guards. And like the longer they continued the experiment, the 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 people that were pretending to be guards started being more cruel and unusual towards the prisoners, and the prisoners started acting more like actual criminals and, and prisoners. So psychologically, that kind of pushed them into uh, that, that archetype, if you will. Um, yep. so, so it just proves your point. Criminals become super criminals in jail and people become a little bit cruel and unusual when they're in that capacity of being guards in that environment too. Yep. So very, very, very interesting. Well, one thing that I will say about all this in terms of, you know, my own commentary for what it's worth is, um, go scratch your own itch, right? Do what you've done. And, and not you specifically, I'm saying people that are listening to the show are watching right now because, I don't think, and I think this is a big, and this is my own personal belief, and maybe it is yours. It sounds like it's yours, but I'm not going to sit around and wait for some bureaucrat to fix the world's problems, right? Like there are solutions and conversations that need to be had that you yourself can have, even if right now you don't think that you're capable of having those, 
those discussions or creating the solution thereof, right? You are a perfect example of doing that from a garage to somebody that now is doing high level stuff that's, that's, you know, 95% of the police forces drive around using your stuff. That's amazing, right? And that happened as a result of your desire to fix a problem. So I would really encourage people, and I'm sure you would as well, to go out and be like, you know what? This is a problem that I want to fix and I'm going to go find a solution for it. And I'm just going to take, not take no for an answer and do it, right? So I, I commend you for that. It's amazing. I love what you're doing. I love that you're also tying that now into a book because I think it has a lot of societal ramifications in a positive sense. Um, and so I also want to say, what can people do? Well, is the book out? Is it, is it released or is this pre-release right now? It is released. It's out on you know, Amazon and, and uh, you know, all the typical booksellers. Uh, or you just go on endofkilling.com. Endofkilling.com is the, the URL you said? Yep, endofkilling.com. Perfect. All right. Uh, so is there anywhere else people can go to learn more about your work? Obviously, if they want to check out Axon or, or any of their personal you know, interests that you have, people you'd, you'd recommend they go check out what you're up to or connect with you further? Yeah. Uh, if you go to the axon.com website or you can follow me on Twitter, uh, hashtag end of killing. Perfect. Awesome. Rick, I appreciate it, man. I enjoyed the conversation. I'm sure we could talk for another few hours and happy biohacking, my friend. <laughs> All right. Thanks. It's been awesome. Let's do it again. All right, buddy.